Everybody, it's Tyler here at the World Championship second team, number 1771, North Gwinnett Robotics. This team, absolutely phenomenal, coming out of Peachtree, uh, where uh, many of you probably saw the match where they won a semifinal match, 1v3, which is where it got my attention. But this team has absolutely been dominating uh, Peachtree and looking to be a top contender here uh, in their division as well. And to help me speak more about this robot, by the way, I have Nick, Preas, Joseph, Sonnet. And this robot here, of course, following the cargo journey, but uh, it's a wooden robot. You would not believe what goes into this as well, too. So can't wait to talk more about their design, their climber, and everything else coming up here on Behind the Bumpers. Your destination for first content, updates, and gaming. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. First updates now, supported by Stryker Careers. If you're a college student or recent graduate looking for an incredible internship, take a look at Stryker. Stryker provides a housing stipend, great pay, and an opportunity to work with state-of-the-art medical technology equipment. Discover why so many first alumni are coming to Stryker for their internship or career at careers.stryker.com. First updates now, supported by Kettering University. Kettering University hosts three co-op employment fairs each year for incoming and current students. Participating in the co-op employment process at Kettering is a great way to begin turning your robotics experience into a professional career to earn money towards graduating debt-free. If you are a senior, it's not too late to apply at kettering.edu slash apply. So let's start out, uh, Nick, with your uh, uh, intake area and talking about that cargo journey through. So you got a nice uh, wide intake, but I'd love to hear about some maybe design iterations and what went into everything that for your robot. So when we were designing the intake, we kind of started with uh, a folding intake. We wanted to have a channel that can ride, and we didn't want to have it go over bumpers because uh, that would uh, take paths. So what it does is the intake, as when it folds down, it rides along these bumpers. Mechanisms pull the ball centered and there's Velcros on the side that help it go inside. We have a uh, bottom roller and top roller have Velcro, so it pulls it in and it holds it very firmly. And we, it pulls it in like within like seconds. Uh, it can hold two balls, it can pull in two balls at a time. It's pretty efficient at uh, getting everything from the corner all the way down. So all everything in the front of the robot gets sucked in basically, like a vacuum, and it works really amazingly. Our intake is really beefy, like we beefed it up a lot yeah. over the time. Like at first we didn't have all these wood pieces here and there. Uh, we added those after our like first uh, event. We were like, oh, it's a little bit more flimsy. We can add brace it more. We added a bit more bracing. Um, after that, it kind of goes up over. Uh, there's two, t it's a two stage elevator. Um, our intake is from there to about right here, okay. which uh, holds two balls. So we don't uh, exceed the momentary phase, uh, which is you can't hold more than two balls for yep. over three seconds. Uh, that's uh, our limit. So once that ball is in there, you will have another ball, and it won't be able to take a third one in. Uh, and then we, when we want to have like more than three balls in the bot, we're like, oh, we want to make have a thing where we can have three balls in there and yeah. shoot three balls for at that, a time for that one competition. Yeah, like you can exactly, hold 20. exactly. Yeah, gotcha. All right. So that's when we pull it, pull it, pull it into the elevator upper stage, where we have the color sensor. Uh, it, we have rejection. So it, um, when uh, the color sensor senses, let's say we're blue and there's a red ball coming up. It senses that it's a red ball. It will turn the turret uh, 10 degrees that way. Shooter speed will go down and hood will go down. So it basically rejects it completely. And then we, and then elevator kind of do, does a little bounce. It will bring the blue ball down and back up so it has time to recover from all the changes it made. And it will shoot the balls in. What if uh, what if you have like the correct ball and then the incorrect ball will just come come back out through your bottom? Uh, no, the, so it, it's, if we have a correct ball and then an incorrect, I'll shoot the correct one. Okay, gotcha. Wait for the incorrect one and then make the changes like within like 0.2 of a second. Yeah. And then shoot that one out. And then if let's say we have three balls in there, correct, not correct, correct. Uh, it will shoot. It will uh, loop it out. And then the third one will do the little hopper thing where it goes back down and comes back up so it has time to recover and it goes back in. Looking from your team, uh, talking about cargo acquisition, your team is being able to just like with ease, just it just seems like get your cycle times down mm -hmm. so quickly. What do you think it's been one of the biggest contributing factors to that? Uh, because, okay, so basically our whole thing, robot was designed around strategy. We can hold more than three balls, all that. Uh, one of the other things is we're, our, our shooter is really fast, where we have, um, uh, we have but developed the shooter like over a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, this is like our fifth generation of the shooter. So uh, over time, we've just been improving on one thing at a time. This year, we added backspin. Last year, it was the rapid react where we had the whole uh, flywheel set up and like all of that with the hood design. Uh, that was last year. And this year, we have like backspin. Uh, we have like half and half backspin. So we have the like nice curve on the ball. Sure. 
And so it's really fast. It's a really quiet shooter. It'll be shoot like at from 2,000 to 2,900 RPMs. Yep. So it's not like a long range to where you have to wait for the shooter to come up. Uh, it just instantly up and running. So we just have fast cycle times and that. So I've seen your robot shooting from all over on the field, but where would you say is like your sweet spot on the field that you like to uh, shoot from? Um, our sweet spot would be like the ring around the pad, uh, as in the happy donut, as in like where the tarmac is. Yep. But we can shoot practically from anywhere in the field. Yeah. Even in the hangar, actually, we've tested I've that. Seen, so yeah, it's kind of, so. kind of good. Um, one of the, one of the best things about our shooter is that we have battery shoot, which means let's say we fell or something and the limelight doesn't work, we can just uh, go up, uh, up against the bumpers uh, with the bumpers up against the goal and just shoot into the high goal or the low goal, e either one. Uh, and our autonomouses, they have the thing where you can take the limelight completely off and it'll still run a six ball uh, completely fine with 100% uh, accuracy. Sure. Uh, so we don't need a camera for uh, like our autons and stuff. It will just, it knows where the nice goal is. Nice to have the fail safes, yeah. absolutely. Let's uh, let's move on to your climber uh, mechanism. Prius uh, is going to talk a little bit more about that. And I'm not sure if we could uh, demo any sort of climb sequence or anything like that. That would be really cool too. Um, we could. Yeah. Our climb sequence is a bit funky. It requires us to tip the butt over yeah. and tip it back. Because we use a gyro to make sure there's no timers, there's nothing that can be thrown off by the swing, thrown off by uh, maybe some bot hitting you. It's based off how you're angled and where in the swing you are. And that requires us to tip the bot and tip back over. It looks kind of funky, but we can demonstrate it. Well, yeah, I mean, anything you can show off for it and then yeah, uh, just kind of walk perfect. us through uh, what's happening. It might be happening. a bit hard with the tether, but we can definitely try it. All right. Um, so basically the way our climber works is we have this middle arm that goes straight up, latches onto the mid bar, pulls us up, and then these arms come down and we're stuck on the mid bar. Uh, we then come up, tilt over, these come down, we tilt almost basically horizontal, and we're almost like <laughs> per parallel to the ground. Uh, this extends out, and then we latch onto the next bar and start swinging wildly. Uh, What's your uh, timing on that? Like how many seconds typically is your uh, traversal uh, climb? So we go to any of the bars, but our mid climb takes about a second. Uh, our high climb takes around two to three seconds, and our traverse takes nine to ten seconds. Sure. But yeah, like I said, anything we can show off for, I, I know we might not have to give, be able to get the full package in uh, for yeah. something like that, but let's show off for what happens and just let us know what happens when it's deploying. So you see, we've, uh, say we're now, we're now over the mid bar, you press the button, traverse, yeah. We are now lashed onto the mid bar and we are tipped over now. We've now reached the right angle, and the right angle again. Now we're on the high bar. No, I think one of the interesting things is a lot of teams are try when they climb, they try to mitigate their swing and their tip, yeah. but you're actually embracing it, right? Yeah. You're just going all the way over. We're using the momentum of the swing to yeah. propel us to the next bar. Oh, I love it. That's great. And then when so. we get to the traverse, it's actually really violent. We're completely extended on the bar, and we essentially act as a pendulum directly into the lion station yeah. wall. <laughs> and it's so violent, but it's very exciting. I mean, it's great to make sure you're paying attention, I guess, yeah. as we go through. Uh, let's continue moving on. Let's talk about uh, uh, Swerve and some programming. We'll talk a little bit more about odometry as well. Uh, so Joseph's going to talk a little bit more uh, what's gone into that uh, and a bit more about the autonomous modes. So our Swerve modules this year are the Swerve Drive subspecialties, Swerve Drive specialties Mark IV inverted modules. We focused on those because we wanted to make sure that they would be protected because we knew there would be a lot of running over bots this year. And we also wanted our weight to be very down low. To that was one of the things that we focused on this year to prevent the tipping from having such a tall robot was getting the weight down low. So we actually have 11 motors within four inches of the bottom and that really helped us make a non-tipping robot. As far as odometry goes, I spent about two months with our robot from last year, which had Mark III swerve modules, to tune code that would use odometry, which basically looks at the wheels and looks at their speed and angle and uses kinematics to find out the direction of the robot and tracks it over the course of a match to find out which way your bot has moved and see where it is on the field. And then it, it can follow a path that you draw out in a program called Path Planner, which allows you to create points on a map, on the field map, and then it, your robot would follow them and rotate at points as you desire, because it's where they can rotate as you're traveling along the path. Uh, I know we'll show a little bit on the computer screen in a second, but before we do that, I do want to ask you, any team that mentions the dimensionary, I'd love to hear about how are you correcting for drift during the match so you know where you're at at all times? So we only use odometry mainly in the first 15 seconds for the oh, autonomous okay. period. We did have a feature that would 
aim the turret using odometry, and it would just know where the goal is and where we are on the field. But we found that that would drift too much over the match because of defense and running into bots or running into the wall or maybe just slipping on the carpet. And we decided not to rely on that and just have the operator orient the turret towards the goal. And then once the camera has a lock, the camera takes over and orients it toward the goal. But for the first 15 seconds, we found our odometry to be almost like 95% accurate. Yeah, I, I mean, at that point, right? Over the entire match, you see a bit more drip, but if you only get to your so that makes sense. Uh, let's wrap up in your robot. Uh, we're going to hand it over to Sana uh, to talk about more of the uh, design. And we mentioned earlier, you, I mean, I had no clue until you told me this, that your robot is mostly wood uh, on this as well, too. So I'd love to just hear about uh, the, the choice to go that route, uh, how it's worked out for you, uh, any challenges, any advantages, that sort of thing, too. Well, one of the things is that this uh, team has always done wooden robots ever since we were a team created in 2006. There's a lot of advantages, if you ask me, and not too many disadvantages. Sure. One of my favorite things is that it's highly adaptable. So what uh, happens is eventually over the season, some you get some wear and tear. Down here on the intake, you'll notice a couple little wood blocks. We just added those in for extra support, and it was really easy. You just get wood glue and screws, and you add it in there, and it's incredibly easy. Another thing as well is that it is very, very durable. Um, we used to be a primarily defensive team, and that yeah. meant that we could go like running into other bots and nothing would break. Even this year at our first competition, we fell from the traversal and nothing important broke. A little bit about the design process of our team is that we spent a lot of time in CAD, and we also didn't do any prototyping at all. A part of that, though, is that this turret has been the fifth generation of a turret. Started in 2009, I believe, was the first year that we had a shooter game that we did a turret. Over here, we also have the 2020 turret, which was the Infinite Recharge, and it worked out primer like very well for us. And then down here a little bit is the 2012 turret. So just over the years, we've been doing a lot of different iterations of the same design, and it's worked out really well for us. Well, North Point Robotics, uh, absolutely phenomenal this year. Uh, can't wait to see how your team uh, competes here at the World Championship level. But um, your team has definitely jumped into that upper echelon of teams uh, in first. So I wish you best of luck here, and thanks a lot for taking the time to tell us about your robot. Thank you. Thank you so much. First Updates Now is supported by the Milwaukee School of Engineering. MSOE offers week-long summer camps where high school students get to preview college by living on campus, exploring engineering programs, experimenting in labs, meeting with professors, and participating in fun group activities. Are you ready to experience STEM at MSOE? Visit msoe.edu slash summer to learn more and register. Thanks to Stryker Careers for their support in this video. First alumni and mentors are making Stryker a top priority for their internships and careers. That's because Stryker knows that those in first are the leaders and innovators of tomorrow. If you want to help make the world a better place by creating life-saving medical devices and technology, get started at careers.stryker.com. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now. And check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.